Today, we're very excited to listen to Chelsea Foxwell, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Chicago, Bradley Bailey, the Ding Tsung and Wei Feng Chao Curator of Asian Art at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and Tsunoda Takuro, Curator at the Kanagawa Prefectural Museum of Cultural History. They will be giving their perspectives about the curatorial joys of working on Meiji art and culture. This all came about because JASA is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And to celebrate this milestone, we chose to ask Chelsea and Bradley to be our co-curators and really delve into this sort of understudied facet of Japanese art history. The show is currently on at the Asia Society Museum in New York until January 7th, and we're delighted that Bradley Bailey will be giving two tours of the exhibition in New York, December 6th at 11 and December 7th at 3 p.m. You can sign up, members and non-members alike, on our homepage, japaneseartsoc.org. I am delighted to turn over the microphone to Chelsea, and I we think on behalf of everybody, we are delighted that Tsunoda-san got up so early to be with us from Japan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, welcome, everyone. Oh, I see the CC button. Can I try clicking it? Yes, please. That was anticlimactic. Yeah. Oh, I see three dots. I think this is just for your PowerPoint. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, um, just to repeat, uh, thank you so much, Allison. Um, and uh, thank you to the other members of the program committee, uh, Amy Poster, Victoria Melendez. And thank you, of course, to Helen Goldberg and um, to my uh, co-presenters tonight, Bradley Bailey and Takuro Tsunoda. Uh, just as a reminder for those of you who are still uh, filtering in, coming in, uh, if you would like to see closed captioning for tonight's presentation, there is a link to click on in the in the chat window, and those captions, live captions, will appear in the um, in a separate browser window for you. So you may have to exit the full screen in order to see that. Um, and uh, if you have a question at any point, you can uh, type it into the Q&A box. All right, so tonight's event uh, came under the um, auspices of the Japanese Art Society of America. And uh, the occasion was that my longtime colleague, the curator and professor Takuro Tsunoda, whom you're about to meet, uh, recently came to New York to conduct research and to see the Meiji Modern Exhibition now on view at Asia Society. Professor Tsunoda has worked on Nihonga, Yoga, Prince, and most recently on craft objects of the Meiji era. Earlier this year, he co-curated an exhibition at the Aichi Prefectural Museum of Art in Nagoya uh, that you see here. Uh, this was Kindai Nihon no Shikaku Kaika, Kou Shiao Seiyo to Nihon no Imeiji. And this can be roughly translated as Modern Japan's Visual Revolution, mutually responsive images of the West and Japan. Um, in um, the several years of, of Bradley and I and, and all the um, planning committee and JASA planning Meiji Modern, one question that we frequently had from JASA members and other people was, how do the objects preserved in Japanese collections on Meiji art compared to those in preserved in US or foreign collections? Um, and further then, how does our exhibition Meiji Modern relate to exhibitions of Meiji art in Japan? So Bradley and I didn't have a chance to see Tsunoda-san's exhibition, um, but we uh, are so lucky that we, um, you know, there's a catalog you can, you can buy and um, that we've gotten to speak to Tsunoda-san now um, and exchange ideas about exhibiting Meiji art in the US and Japan. And we'd like to, um, present this webinar as a means of furthering that conversation. So our program will proceed as follows. First, uh, Bradley and I will offer a brief overview of our exhibition Meiji Modern with some reflections on the curatorial process. 
Then Professor Tsunoda will give an overview and comments of his exhibition and research. And then finally, we're gonna have a little round table and time permitting, take questions from the audience. Um, and you're welcome to post your questions in the Q&A. So I'll get started with my very brief overview of Meiji Modern. Some of you may remember the pair of very influential articles uh, by uh, Dr. Mimi yangbruk Sawan and the late Dr. Yoshiaki Shimizu published in the Art Bulletin in 2001 and reflecting on the state of the field of Japanese art. Professor Shimizu wrote, the canon of discriminating artworks in Japan uh, mainly applies to the works from before the 17th century. He adds, more Edo period works, specifically paintings of the middle to late Edo period, have joined the ranks of designated canonical objects in recent years. And uh, he names Jakuchu as an example of one of these more recent inductees to the canon. Um, so there's no mention of the Meiji period until the end of his article when he writes, a more recent sign is encouraging. Doctoral dissertation topics pursued by graduate students are now extending into the very late Edo, Meiji, Taisho, and even Showa periods. Today, of course, the situation has changed quite a bit with um, many uh, students emerging uh, to study 20th century and even contemporary Japanese art every year uh, in graduate school. The once expressed view that Meiji art looks too European or that Meiji isn't old enough has receded into the distance. Uh, scholars have pointed out that modernity uh, should not be seen as singular and originating in Euro-America, but rather um, that modernity is multiple and is about kind of a shared temporality, uh, shared values, and a heightened awareness of one's difference from the past, as well as a um, literal geopolitical and commercial convergence in, in markets, in the form of markets and government diplomacy, precisely the forces that precipitated Japan's so-called opening to the West in the 1850s. And so part of the um, uh, fun of organizing Meiji Modern was to see that despite the changing ups and downs in, in fashions and what is popular to study within Japanese art, uh, for very many years, members of the Japanese Art Society of America had been cherishing and collecting marvelous examples of Meiji art, uh, such as this detail um, from a book that was in the collection of the late Mrs. Burke, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and you can view it at the Asia Society in our exhibition. So among the previous exhibitions of Meiji art in the US and Europe, uh, in 1980, the Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell University presented uh, this exhibition, Imperial Japan, the Art of the Meiji Era, curated by the late Frederick Bakeland, a co-founder of JASA. The exhibition was divided by medium and was notable for also containing calligraphy as well as paintings, prints, and craft objects. In a ref reflection of the prevailing sentiment uh, toward uh, Meiji, the direct, then director of the museum, Thomas Leavitt, spoke of Meiji art's lack of aesthetic restraint, he says, uh, it's quote, enthusiastic adaptation of stylistic qualities from the West, as well as its quote, exuberant decorativeness, end quote. Uh, in uh, the years since uh, this pioneering 1980 exhibition, um, a number of exhibitions uh, um, featured various aspects of Meiji art, either focusing on a, a one type of uh, art, such as uh, Japanese military prints or uh, takikate, one uh, individual artist, Yoshitoshi. Uh, there were also several exhibitions about the Meiji period as a whole that featured the famed Kalili collection, which has preserved many important works of Meiji era crafts, painting, and sculptures exhibited at the World's Fairs. So one question uh, for Meiji Modern was how can we balance American curator collections strengths in art made for the world's fairs, while also displaying works that were not necessarily made for foreign audiences and which could be quite subtle and restrained in their aesthetics. Uh, at the same time, uh, we need to challenge the assumption that uh, a work of art, you know, a work of Meiji art was either made for export or for a domestic Japanese audience. In fact, 
the mixing of these two goals and audiences was one of the key features of Meiji art. And this is an aspect that will emerge in Professor Tsunoda's talk as well. The thematic structure of Meiji Modern was designed to provide multiple entry points into the exhibition, regardless of the viewer's interests or background. It also enabled us to flexibly switch out objects between venues. And some of the objects you'll see in New York are unique to that venue, while other objects will join the exhibition for the Smart Museum or Houston presentations. We hope that visitors will be able to see the exhibition at each of its three venues. And in Chicago and Houston, it'll be even bigger than in New York, and we'll be able to consider additional themes such as militarism or Meiji enthusiasm for Chinese culture or Sinophile culture, and the construction of new identities for men and women uh, through Kuchie prints and other types of illustrations that were meant to accompany new types of Japanese fiction. So just the very briefest of all reviews, our first room, Crafting the Modern, a Modern State, introduces um, how craft objects uh, really created and reinforced an image of Japan and provided a kind of um, uh, economic basis uh, for Japan to offset uh, the trade imbalance with the West of the time. So we have early craft objects made for the World's Fairs, such as the Cloisonne Cock and Drum made for the Vienna World's Fair of 1873. And in this room, you can also see changes to the built environment of Japan as represented through hand-colored photographs, as well as trains, um, gas lamps, and electric lamps. Uh, the second exhibition, Navigating Changing Seas, um, captures the many ways that images of, of the seas and oceans and, and nautical themes um, played a role in Japanese art, uh, both before and after the Meiji Restoration. And these can range from images of, of sea life, aquatic life, um, to these beautiful images of the ocean, to the black ships, uh, to Meiji military na and naval prints. Uh, one challenge that we faced, and here you can see our third room called Fashioning the Self, one challenge that we faced in putting together this exhibition was that we had a strong desire to present Meiji oil paintings and watercolors, the so-called yoga or Western style painting. Um, but by design, our exhibition was focused on Meiji art in American collections. Um, and so uh, oil paintings works in so-called Western mediums were extremely hard to find. So we didn't want to replicate the Orientalist history of foreign collecting of Japanese art in our exhibition. And we were very pleased to find three oil paintings all in private collections in the US. Uh, for example, this uh, painting by Mitsutani Kunishiro, who toured the US and Europe multiple times, um, including with the printmaker Yoshida Hiroshi. And this painting is similar to um, it's Tony's painting from the same era that's preserved in the Tokyo National Museum. Well, we hope that our exhibition can further stimulate the collecting and appreciation and study of Meiji era oil paintings and watercolors. And uh, in our subsequent venues, we're also going to be including more uh, Japanese watercolors, uh, Sosakuhanga prints, and Chinese style bunjinga um, in, in other works. So the fourth of the fifth section is, is about historical and mythological themes. These themes are, of course, already known and loved from earlier periods of Japanese art, but we argue that they take on a new dimension, um, create, forming national consciousness and uh, conveying certain messages about um, uh, 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 two viewers, whether those viewers are Jap other Japanese or um, they were meant to be Western viewers. And in our final section, uh, Cultivating modern, uh, the Modern Aesthetic, um, shows how late Meiji art used nature motifs in synchronicity with the global Art Nouveau movement while resonating with a wide audience in Japan and abroad. So JASA is a collection, uh, is an organization centered around collectors. And these collectors made a point of acquiring really outstanding objects. And some of those objects were Meiji objects. Uh, these collectors found individual objects that they fell in love with, and we fell in love with them in turn. And uh, so for them, what I really uh, came to realize is that 
Meiji period was far from a dry academic category. And um, we really have had the privilege of borrowing beloved objects from both collectors and museums and objects that uh, in many cases were uh, acquired during the Meiji period and also reveal a history of kind of US Japan relations. Uh, so I'll just leave you with a few of the themes, um, nationalism and competition, which often get conveyed in images of animals. You have cosmopolitanism, the forging of identities, the consciousness of medium and the act of representation, um, and uh, artistic dialogue and artistic exchange that and works that were acquired by US collectors in the Meiji period. So through all these, we discovered that not only is modernity itself multiple in time and space throughout the globe, but that uh, there are multiple ways that Meiji art can be modern uh, through subject matter, medium, identity, mode of depiction, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, we hope that uh, you enjoy the exhibition at, at any of its venues. And I would like to turn uh, it over to my amazing colleague and co-curator Bradley Bailey. Amazing, I had to unmute. Thank you, thank you, Chelsea, that was great. And of course, I appreciate you know, that you started with uh, reference to that seminal piece by uh, Mimi and Kruksawa, who was my, both my undergraduate and my graduate uh, advisor. So I remember uh, just after that piece was published and how exciting that was. Uh, I'm also grateful, Chelsea, that you spoke about the first half of our title, Meiji Modern, with such eloquence and in such detail, because I'm actually going to address one of our goals with the second half of the title. So could we go to the next slide, please? Chelsea's very kindly controlling my slides, thank you. Um, as, as you know, the, the, the title, and I, I know from uh, the previous iteration of this event that Meiji Modern as a title got a lot of attention, but I actually would like to focus briefly on this 50 Years of New Japan, which is a publication that I have known for quite some time uh, actually, since since my days at Yale, when I uh, first encountered it, along with many other rare books um, on the shelves of Sterling Library. Um, but this this book was very fascinating. And as you can see here, it was compiled by Count Shige, uh, Oko, Okuma Shigenobu, um, and who is shown here uh, in two different portraits, which I think encapsulate kind of the spirit of the age and what I'm going to talk about. These are not in the show, but I'm just giving you some, some background information He's shown on, on the left, of course, in sort of samurai garb, and on the right as a, a real Meiji count, Shishaku statesman. Um, this book does contain two chapters on art, on fine art and the applied arts. But what it also discusses in this 50 year period, which doesn't correspond directly to the reign of the emperor Meiji, but rather encompasses a period of industrialization and modernization that occurred following uh, the arrival of Commodore Perry in 1853. So this gave us, this does provide a bit of freedom with the show, but what I really wanted to convey with the show was not only that art was viewed on the same, with the same uh, level of gravity and importance in the establishment of modern Japan as many industries, which are included in this two volume compendium, uh, forestry, agriculture, uh, modern economic systems, the mint, the postal service, the prison system, educational systems, everything, as well as the arts was, was included in this. But more so than that, I really wanted to kind of conjure the spirit of the age and try to convey uh, some of the excitement of the period because Chelsea did a wonderful job of summarizing many of these exhibitions that had been held in previous decades in the United States. And these principally focused on, on some of the things that we do touch upon, like imperial court artists and world's fairs. But with this exhibition, we really wanted to use American collections to really to truly conjure the world of the Meiji period. And I think, um, can we go to the next slide? And I think we did that, um, especially with our first slide. And I wanted to say one of the things that we tried to do was really to um, emphasize how important the role of art and history and art's role in shaping public perception of history and art in public life was during the period. This is actually a slightly later a statue, but I wanted to show this. This is uh, Okumu, uh, Okuma Shigenobu um, at Waseda. He was the founder of Waseda University and he's here shown as uh, an academic, a true academic in this kind of you know, full academic regalia. But please notice his cane, which here in this, in this sculpture serves to make him appear uh, 
uh, as, a, as a wise older academic, uh, but this was not the original sculpture. Next slide, please. The original sculpture, uh, which you can view in a, one, one has been moved to Saga in Kyushu where he was from. Uh, one has been put into a kind of alcove at Waseda, which you see here on the left. But the original sculpture, which you see in the middle portrayed him as uh, a military general. Uh, and in this context, of course, his cane was because his leg had been, um, he lost his leg in battle. And you can also see the leg in Saga. But even uh, even Count Okuma himself and his iterations as a samurai, uh, military man, statesman, elderly academician and founder of Waseda, even his own case proves the role of art and imagery in shaping in shaping public perceptions of history during the period. Next slide, please. And so Chelsea very brilliantly speaks about uh, this Watanabe Nobukazu, Nobukazu uh, print of Saigo Takamori, uh, you know, and another kind of, uh, he, he did not turn into a statesman uh, like Count Okuma, um, but here is shown in public as a kind of a venerated uh, warrior of the ancient past with a, with a dog a symbol of loyalty in Ueno Park, uh, despite the fact that, of course, he was one of the architects of the Satsuma Rebellion, so in opposition to the current government. But this shows how uh, during this period, there's great enthusiasm for representations of the past, but also kind of, I think this print as well encompasses some of the enthusiasm for modernity and novelty of the period that I think is not fully conveyed if we only focus on imperial court art. It doesn't, again, conjure the world of Meiji, uh, the world of the everyday citizen. Next slide, please. And uh, even in images like this, of course, this is the, the famed image of the Goshina image of the Meiji emperor, the, the vaunted uh, exalted shadow, if you will. But um, I often talk about this image and its composite nature and how it, it was sketched and rephotographed. Uh, but the important thing that our exhibition emphasizes is indeed that an image of a monarch is required and art is one of the things that um, enables this in, this in this 50 years of modern Japan. But one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize even in looking at this image, and I am a great enthusiast for Meiji decorative arts and metalwork, I see an array of cloisonne enamels and metalwork. So even in the production of, um, the production of a modern uh, republic with all of these, uh, this regalia and these metals, these also require applied art industries, the likes of which Count Okuma um, talked about in, in, uh, well, in, in the, uh, the chapter on applied art. Next slide, please. And you can see one of the things that we did in addition to having these, the images of the Emperor Empress is we were able to source uh, prints and other images that show how these things existed and circulated in daily life, often in kind of new rituals, such as this Shinto style veneration of the images of the emperor and empress. And uh, the emperor in this image, of course, is not actually pictured, but I think this is in many ways Yukawa Shodo's uh, nod to the recently expired prohibition on images of the emperor. It also keeps the men out of the, the Bijin God, the, the beauty print, which is focused on women. But in the end, this, this shows not only uh, the importance of these images, but how they how they existed, how they were used, the lives of these images in Meiji Japan. Next slide, please. And I and I think this is really crucial is kind of the experience. Chelsea did mention that we deliberately sought uh, these kind of dramatic shifts in scale with objects, and this is again to convey the enthusiasm and excitement of the period, where some of these things, like this very beautiful vase, which next slide, please is actually this large and required a special oven to be made. Uh, the, the scale was meant to surprise and astound. Uh, and so we've really tried to convey that in the show by alternating between works that were made for private consumption or even everyday kind of enjoyment like a print and things such as this vase uh, that were, well, this was commissioned for the Yale University Art Gallery, but the likes of which uh, were shown at World's Fairs and other public Expositions, including domestic exhibitions in Japan. Next slide, please. 
And as you can see, uh, I encourage you all to go see this in person. Unlike many, many large scale pieces of cloisonne enameling, this one uh, is also very fine uh, in its detail and uses uh, Musen or wireless cloisonne enameling throughout to achieve these beautiful gradations of color, which not only approach, but indeed surpass painting in many ways. Um, next slide, please. Um, but I just wanted to, to in with these last uh, three slides, to show that one of the challenges that we faced was that it was a period of great innovation and invention and adaptation. And so these two very different aesthetics can exist uh, within a, a span of only 30 or 40 years, let alone the 50 that I have been referencing. And so you have here on the left, this incredible Yokohama uh, print, which is meant to imitate a photograph. It even calls itself a shashinkyo, but you can see a photographic image essentially, but you can see um, this frame around the image at left, which is meant to, again, evoke Victorian uh, photography. And, and even this, this print, this impression has been coated with beeswax to give it the sheen of a photograph. But only um, some, you know, 38 years later, when uh, there, there are actual elephants uh, in Japan and a zoo in Ueno, um, so much has changed, not only in the fashions of the people, but even in the, the kind of understanding of elephants, there were live elephants, but even in the, the printing technology. And so this was, this was one of the challenges that we faced uh, with this exhibition and these 50 years of New Japan. But I think by including images like this, which are, Chelsea did mention, we often track the same theme or motif across different media or in different images. And these very cleverly, I think, uh, elucidate the differences uh, in this period. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the things that's most exciting about this period, of course, is, is, is the new technology. And I really, in doing this show, I, again, I keep saying conjure the world of Meiji Japan, but that was what I wanted to do and was how, I, I did very much with this show, wanted to show kind of the novelty, the newness and enthusiasm for certain things, which you definitely see in the, in the Prince of Kyochika. You see enthusiasm for these new, not only lighting apparatuses and ways of making light, but the effects of light. Um, but finally, uh, in closing, I'll just show you these next uh, two slides. Oh, this I included because this is a, a great piece from the show and this will only be shown in New York. So please go, see it, but this is one of Japan's first electrified buildings, um, the Ryo Unkaku in Asakusa, which um, was a, a department store, in fact, and uh, it also contained an elevator. Um, and this piece, as you can see, it's installed to try. We, I, I wish we could simulate the experience of you actually playing this for it as a board game, a multi-leveled, uh, layered board game um, that you actually unfold. But um, we tried to with the installation um, and the catalog show how interactive this would be, but I'll just show you the next slide, which I believe is my second to last slide. Yes, these are incredible plique jour uh, lamp cloaks that are in the, in the show, and they're from around the same time, but as you can see, the one on the right has an opening in the top, indicating it was for a gas lamp, whereas the one on the left is fully enclosed, indicating it was for an electric lamp. Um, so together, these two objects show how quickly uh, Japan was electrified during this period. The transition from, you know, gas lamps to electricity, also their coexistence. But crucially, the way we installed them in the show, and uh, Chelsea, next slide, please. They're illuminated, and especially the one at right uh, with the phoenix, the first time I saw it illuminated, it really transformed. And even this photograph, I should say, this photograph does not fully convey how it looks, but it transformed from a red globe into a purple globe. And I like to think that this, you know, this illumination, actually putting this almost in context, you know, it doesn't have a base, but it is illuminated as it would have been during the period, that this, um, this is a really elegant and beautiful, I think, metaphor for how we really wanted to use these objects and the mix of these objects to not only to introduce people to fine examples of Meiji period art, but to give people the experience of, um, of Meiji Japan. So please, please do go experience it for yourself uh, in New York, Chicago, and Houston. But with that, I believe it is time for our distinguished 
guest Tsunoda san to take over from me. Thank you, Chelsea. It's okay. Okay. Thank you, Parachi. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay. Okay, let's start. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, today I'd like to offer an overview of our historical research of the major period in Japan, as well as some details on my own personal research. My talk will cover these two topics that you see on the screen. I'd like to give you a sense of the type of research of mage art the scholars in Japan have conducted, while also explaining some of the, my own areas of interest. First, please let me introduce myself. I'm a curator at the Kananga Prefecture Museum of Cultural History. The uh, museum was founded in 1967 in Yokohama as a general museum of the humanities. Among museums in Japan, it has a comparatively long history. The building was constructed in 1904, uh, the main branch of the Yokohama Shokin Ginko, or the Yokohama Specie Bank. This bank specialized in foreign transactions and played an important role in modern Japanese history. Given the location and the history of the building, our museum was tasked with the role of researching, collecting, and displaying modern Japanese art since its founding in 1967. I've been the curator in charge of these areas since 2006. In a few minutes, I'll discuss my past research and current interests. In April of 2023, the Aichi Prefecture Museum of Art hosted an exhibition that constitutes one of the most important recent contributions to our understanding of mage art. I'd now like to introduce it to you. I was one of the organizers of this exhibition and about half the objects on display were from my museum's collection. Arch Prefecture is famous for its production of porcelain and colossal animals, so this exhibition also became an opportunity to consider mesh art from the point of view of Arch Prefecture. The exhibition consisted of four parts. I'd like to introduce some notable artworks from each part while explaining the concept behind this vision. Part one focused on painting. Costa Hall II was one of, was one of the Gossetta school, which I will introduce in a few moments. He was only 18 years old when he painted this screen pair. The left hand screen depicts two samurai gazing at Mount Fuji. The right screen showed people in mage period dress riding a ferry. In other words, the artist deliberately juxtaposes the edge and mage period in the two halves of screen period. This work was made 15 years after the founding of the mage era, but the culture and the feeling of the edge period still remained. Western elements entered into the world of air culture and mixed with it. This screen period is a good representative of painting in the first half of the Mage era. There are many well-known paintings that are considered to be representative of the Mage period, but we do not select such works uh, for this exhibition. Instead, we place the emphasis on lesser known artist's work, which propelled early modern painting into the modern era. We took special care to spotlight the Gosta School, the makers of so called Yokohama pictures, Yokohama, and other artists who were among the first to engage with Western painting. Part two of our exhibition presented art education. Major art education focused on the introduction of Western methods and techniques in the elementary and middle grades. It has been pointed out that major art education policies are intimately connected to other aspects of art history. But until now, 
there hasn't been an opportunity to highlight this in an exhibition. This time, the curators felt strongly that education played an important role in Japanese modern, Japan's modernization. So we decided to showcase it as one of the four parts of our exhibition. During the Meiji period, most children's first exposure to Western painting came in the form of the art they encountered in their textbook. It was a huge factor that contributed to change in visuality among the people. This fact was also highlighted in our exhibition's title, Kindai Nihon no Shikakaika, literally, Modern Japan's Visual Revolution, which might also be understood as a opening up or enlightenment of people's visuality and around with it their field of vision. It can be argued that kaika or enlightenment in this period basically meant westernization. In the 1880s, education in western painting methods spread throughout Japan. However, until that point, Japanese institutions had eat almost no one who could proficiently teach with Western painting. It was for that reason that a large number of textbooks were made. Previous research has generated a list of approximately one, uh, one hundred, uh, 100, uh, oh, sorry, 1,000 different titled textbook one art in the Meiji period. In order to better grasp the overall picture of art education in Meiji era, I'm currently leaving the effort to compile database. Right now, it's in Japanese only, but you can see over 10,000 different textbook illustrations. If you are interested, please take a look. Part three of the exhibition focused on prints. As you know, for many years, wood book prints and specific, specifically ukiyo-e prints were the main type of printed picture in Japan. For the mid 19th century, however, copper bright prints and lithography also came to be produced, mainly through government initiative. The main goals were military or economic, especially maps, paper money, and so forth. It can also be said that Western style drawing techniques were disseminated through these print mediums, with the result being that by the mid major era. Ukiyo-e had already exhausted its practical social function. In its place, lithography became the main vehicle for the painting of popular culture of commoners. The Japanese government also used lithographs and copper bright prints to make its policies known in the provinces of the periphery of its control, and thereby to execute its plans. In that sense, the change in print and printing method was not only a factor in artistic change, but also an important factor in social change. Lastly, part four of the exhibition was craft. Uh, this exhibition was held in Aichi, an important site for the production of porcelain and other ceramics. We featured ceramics and glossy animals made in Aichi prefecture, bringing them with export ceramics made in Yokohama and other places. Aichi was known in Japan since ancient time as a ceramic produ producing region. Here, I'd like to introduce a piece made in the 1890s by Noritake, the representative porcelain manufacturer of Japan. Prior to that time period, the company was basing its design on color wood book print, the ukiyo-e bird and flower picture, and so forth. Flying the 1893, the World's Fair in Chicago, the company changed its personal design to those that more closely reflected American taste of that time. In that sense, in our exhibition, we were highly conscious of the 1893 Chicago Columbian Exposition as a turning point. In this way, the category of craft, which had been introduced to Japan as a result of the World Fair, became the 
protagonist of the first half of the Meiji period. In our exhibition, we wanted visitors to ponder the differences and connection between art, manufacturing, and craft. At the exhibition in Aichi, many of the artworks and artifacts on view created before the concept of art was firmly established in Japan. So through this exhibition, we aim to show the process by which art became established in Japan and also to introduce objects that exceeded the realm of art during the process. Up until now, the view of Meiji art in Japan basically reflected the perspective of the Meiji government, which was focused on export in the first half of Meiji and on the cultivation of great artists and culture among the Japanese people in the latter half of Meiji. In our exhibition, we displayed a much broader variety of objects or in one place, including objects that continue trends from the Eight period and objects that were excluded from the category of art uh, for various reasons. In so doing, we helped exhibition visitors gain a holistic view of major visual culture and to appreciate the churn of the objects that are currently excluded from the category of art for uh, art and it is generally conceived as uh, sorry art for various reasons. As a result, I think many visitors came to understand that the field of art as it is generally conceived is narrow and that the major error was the decisive occasion that created this narrowness. We believe our efforts in this exhibition achieved certain results. However, the framework and the hierarchy of Japanese art that was formed in the 20th century is still strong. And some people felt that the work displayed in this exhibition are not art. In order to respond to that, we held a symposium where we talked about what factor led earlier art historian to exclude certain things from the category of major art. Here, I can turn to my the second topic, the study of major art in Japan, the center and the periphery. This is a large bias in the major art research being conducted within Japan. The bias is diagrammed as a slide. The trend of the major government-led art administration was to shift its policy emphasis from exporting objects to foreign countries in the early period to nurturing domestic artists in the latter period. The focus of current research in Japan and the understanding of major art is based on the top of the slide. It is thought that the impression of major art outside of Japan and of Japanese art as a whole is based on the bottom of the slide. Therefore, many research believe that the challenge facing major art research in Japan is to carefully introduce the artifacts of the major era and communicate their appeal. I'd like to prove that Art is a field that was established for political and economic reasons during the Meiji era and thereafter, and encouraged a, a variation of attractive objects that are not considered to be art. There are also differences in the Meiji art narrative featured outside Japan and the one told within Japan. Thinking practically, it will be wonderful if scarred with Japan and outside of Japan could develop a shared holistic of our view of history. We could do this by finding a point of connection. By this, I mean both the connection between early and late Meiji, between low and high art, and in the differences between Japanese and non-Japanese art historical perspectives. In fact, all of these points of intersection can be found in Yokohama and in so-called export art. It is to this topic that I will turn next. One important idea on our research agenda is the 
re-evaluation of those things that had formerly been labeled as QRs or souvenirs. In Japan, art is understood to be a somewhat confusing aggregation. This tendency was especially noticeable during the Meiji era. Also, as shown in the slide, there are many objects created using complex technique and materials. For example, in the door on the left of the slide, the face is painted and the costume is dyed. The right of the slide shows the cover of a hot album. The photographs are important, but the cover are also interesting with lacquer and Shibuya mosaic or inlaid shirts, bones, and metals. It is difficult for researchers to understand such complex objects. 20th century scholars of Japanese art tended to separate each technique and approach into its own category, but sometimes they need to be treated together. It is important to better understand the connection between creative endeavors motivated by the goal of export in the early Meiji period and their connection to art making for domestic audience in the latter half of the Meiji period. What kinds of stimuli did the former derive to the latter? In the current understanding of the Meiji art, it was only after abandoning the discarding the export art of the first half of the Meiji era that the late Meiji art aimed at the domestic audience could come to fruition. What I think that this is a mistake. By investigating our made in Yokohama, I believe that we can find points of linkage and continuity. It is through this topic that we return next. Yokohama is the location of the museum where I work. From Yokohama, many Japanese artworks and artifacts went overseas. The map shown on this slide is a map of the craftspeople and shops that made and sold to ceramics and lacquerware. The asterisk is the location of my museum. Due to the great counter earthquake that occurred 100 years ago, along with the war damage in 1945, almost all of the shops were lost, and the memory of Yokohama was disappeared. Currently, we are striving to explore the works and the materials and reconstruct the impact they had on domestic and international art at the time. The Japanese word bijutsu or art began with the importance of West ideas during the Meiji era. Therefore, it is important to consider the word together with the artifacts made in the, in the Meiji, and especially its relationship with the West and understanding from overseas. As a concrete method for that purpose, I'm conducting research on the artifacts exported to Yokohama. This is because thinking about Yokohama and Meiji will lead to elucidation of the origin of today's Japanese art and understanding of Japanese art found in the other countries. In my most recent research, I studied the Morimura brothers who sold the Japanese items in New York from the 1880s onwards. The items they sold were also missing from the history of Japanese art. The Morimura brothers began their ceramic business as Noritake, which we introduced earlier. But it is known that they handled a wide range of items, including this gear, Metaware and lacquerware. I believe that this kind of research will lead to a deeper understanding of the wholeness, reality, and richness of Japanese art. My research currently spans a broad range of topics, and I'm afraid it is not always easy to make progress. However, I believe that many interesting find await, and my presentation today is also part of that journey. I am so grateful to have uh, received this opportunity to speak to you, and I look forward to a chance to collaborate further. Here's my talk.
Thank you very much my, for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Tsunoda. Uh, and thank you, Bradley, as well. Uh, I'd like to move uh, directly into the, the questions, uh, starting with giving a chance for Bradley to ask uh, Dr. Tsun uh, uh, Professor Tsunoda a question. Thank you. Yeah, I am curious about the difference uh, between what you see as our uh, American uh, view of Meiji, which is, of course, shaped by the history of, of US-Japan relations. And to what extent do you think our current day sort of American view of the Meiji period is shaped by objects and what kind of objects? Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Bradley. I'm also curious about the difference. I strongly feel that the Michael's view of Japanese art is based on the collections in America. I believe that the craft and ukiyo-e prints, many of which are on display at this exhibition, strongly define the American historical perspective and tastes. However, at the same time, you have also tried to deepen your understanding of Japanese art through books and uh, other means. If there is a difference between Japanese people's view of Japanese art, it is possible that the uh, information you have learned through books and other sources is biased. In other words, major art research in Japan was still mature, and the situation uh, continued for a long time, with most of the information being about famous artists and works. Unfortunately, in Japan, our view of Japanese art has been formed by concentrating only on a few famous artists and works. Moreover, unlike in America, there is little awareness of crafts. I guess that uh, this difference in historical view also led to differences in tastes. As a result, many artifacts survived in America, and I am happy about this. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Tsunoda-san. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting actually to compare this situation to the Western artworks that yoga painters or Western style painters in Japan, oil painters, were able to study while they were in Japan because similarly their their points of view were restricted by especially what was, well, as you said, what was published in, in books and lithography collections, most of which overemphasized British painters and um, also by plaster casts. Um, and as I've mentioned, and I wrote in my dissertation, you can even see on some early drawings by painters like Aoki Shigeru and others, um, the marks on these plaster casts showing that they're from Bruciani and company or these other London based firms. So it's a very English uh, point of view. And I think that's um, an interesting comparison. Okay. Yeah, I think it. I agree. It's important to think about the case of yoga uh, artist in the United States and the other countries. There are few examples of yoga. Yeah, yoga artists were interested in European classic and modern art. However, non-Japanese people do not pay much attention to them and their works. Mm -hmm. It would be great if non-Japanese viewers uh, could become more familiar with Japanese oil paintings and watercolors. It is true that there are few collections outside of Japan uh, compared to Japanese style paintings and crafts. One reason for this was that few Japanese Western painters at the time had a chance to venture overseas. The history of art in the Meiji period begins with the discussion of Western painting. However, there are very few collections of yoga in America or other countries. This point is also one of the reasons why there is a difference in the understanding of Meiji art history. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Do you have any question for us, Tsunoda uh, san Okay, yeah, I have one question, uh, trusted to have uh, Friday. Yeah, when I visit this exhibition, yeah, um, Mage Modern in New York, I was surprised by the high quality of the works in the United States and in this exhibition. As a result of your efforts, 
outstanding works by artists who are not so major in art history are now being featured. How do you balance the work as of artist's merit of quality with the objects that are more historical significant? Yeah, how do you balance? Thank you. Can I go ahead, Radley? Oh, well, I think, I think we, have, we have maybe two different perspectives uh, because uh, as a curator, I, I look for things that are very impactful or exciting. Um, and so they don't always have to be, I always say it's better to have a work that is great by a lesser known artist than a work by a great artist that is not so amazing. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, especially because the public, the American public has not gone to a Meiji period exhibition in a long time. I was really thinking about we have to surprise and excite them. So yeah, that, that was how I approached it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, that has been, you know, part of the fun of working on this exhibition is seeing so many works uh, that uh, were little known or by artists who are little known and just being wowed by them. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Um, I think we only have uh, three minutes left. Um, uh, I think actually um, Hollis Goodall has a related question that's <laughs> equally it kind of challenge, you know, it kind of relates to Tsunoda-san's question kind of about the standards for choosing among, you know, multiple available artworks. Uh, so I would say that, um, uh, yeah, one of the things that we did uh, because we can't include everything, of course, was uh, to select several objects that all had similar themes. So whether it be the EQ and the skeleton theme, to be able to show the treatment of the hell courtesan and EQ and in in wood, in ivory, in painting, and um, you know, in in screens, hanging scrolls, books, right, and connect the skeleton, the use of the skeleton to anatomy. So um, we uh, try to find these resonances of of works that maybe share a theme, but do so in, in different materials. Another great theme of of Meiji art is arhats, right? Like, why are there so many arhat works in Meiji art? I think part of it is because of the uh, extraordinary um, accomplishment of Kazu Kano Kazunobu's 500 arhats that the Freer and Sackler were able to exhibit uh, several years ago. Uh, so it's interesting to see how these how these themes get in. I don't know, Bradley, if you want to take a shot at that question as well. Uh, no, I think that's a, that's a great way of putting it because since we decided to do a thematic organization, it wasn't it, it wasn't as though there were all of these specific historical boxes that we needed to tick, and so um, like, as Chelsea said, yeah, many many of these kind of themes we we, we started to kind of there there were current themes throughout the Meiji era, but we would find like a stellar object like the Kokunimasa uh, Gaiko skeleton skeleton screens and um, and sort of build build out around around them. Um, so that I think that's how it worked. It was very, very organic. Yeah. And maybe just in our last one minute, I'll say that uh, to Dr. Pat Graham, yes, all the art that's exhibited at all the all the venues at any of the venues is in the exhibition catalog. So uh, we would, uh, you know, definitely refer you to our catalog and hope that everyone gets to see the exhibition. I'll I would just amend that. I would just amend that by saying that I am I'm a little bit of a, a spendthrift and I get excited and I buy too much stuff for my museums. There are a few things. Ooh, in beautiful. Houston that will be surprises but only a very few so Pat please come to Houston I would love to welcome you to Houston to, to show you those few things well I would like to thank all three of you and before we get off the screen we have a question for Tsunoda-san about who is the Meiji artist who is the most popular in Japan wow <laughs> that's a difficult question yeah most most Pretty much, yeah, yeah. I think uh, Kano Hogai, yeah, in Japan, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the Western paintings are Kuro Daseiki. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Thank you all three so much. This was really a wonderful light onto the, the Meiji world. And um, I will hope, I, I know that I will be seeing the exhibition in each venue. And I hope Tsunoda san, you will come back and see it in, also in Chicago and also in Houston. And I would like to uh, let everybody know that our next webinar is December 14th with Rachel Saunders of the Harvard Art Museums. The title is Seeing the Trees, Ecology and Imagination in Japanese Art. So thank you, everybody, and uh, see you soon. Good night. <laughs>